today, packing the house, um, to have a sober, data-filled discussion about the power plant that has since 1955 uh, burned coal on the shores of our beloved Seneca, uh, Cayuga Lake. Uh, and we are asking the question, um, what do we want the fate of this power plant to be? Now that there is a plan in the work to switch out the coal to frack gas that would come uh, to this power plant by a truck from Pennsylvania. And we're having this PowerPoint filled, data and chart filled, sober discussion because here in the Finger Lakes, when we make a, a, a opinions known to our governor about what we want, we are informed by science. That's how we roll here in the Finger Lakes. So first we yeah. look at the science, and then we're going to have a kick-ass rally, because we are considering the fate of this power plant not just on any day of the year, but on, uh, we're considering this, on, I thought that would be good, but this, <laughs> we're considering it on September 8th for all around the world. In over 800 different venues, people are rising for climate, for justice, and for renewable energy jobs. And so this amazing conversation we're having takes place in the right place on the shores of this beautiful lake and in the right time. So you are in the right time at the right place, which yep. is always an amazing right. feeling <laughs> as we begin this conversation with each other as a community about how we want to turn the lights on how we want to power our community. What is the vision that we have for this? We're doing this in a time of climate emergency. We're doing it at a time when we have seen uh, record-breaking heat waves. We've seen floods that brought nine inches of rain to Lodi, one of our sister villages here in the Finger Lakes, that closed uh, Watkins Glen uh, potable water for nine straight days and chased out a three-day music concert. So as we uh, come to terms with the way in which climate change is sinking its teeth into our community, that's the moment that we're having this discussion. And communities just like ours all around the planet are doing just the same thing at this moment. So we're part of something really big. We will remember this day for the rest of our lives. And so we have this amazing lineup of speakers to bring you. And I will introduce them all together now, and then they can just uh, come straight up here to the podium. First, we're going to hear um, from Vera Scroggins, um, resident of Susquehanna County and a resident of the gas fields uh, in the heart of the fracking boom of Pennsylvania. Vera is a citizen journalist, a videographer, and an activist who has done more to bear witness to the horror show that is fracking than anyone else I know. Uh, the industry, the gas industry calls her a serial protester. Which I, I, want, I want to be called that. I think we should all be called that. So, uh, what a badge of honor. She's the most uh, unflinching uh, activist I know. Not only is she coming here to bear witness to us about where the gas comes from that will be brought to this uh, power plant, but she's also uh, doing the videography to document our uh, time together here. Uh, and then next, we will hear from Irene Weiser, who has the, the best last name because she's the wisest person I know. She is a council member from the town of Caroline, uh, coordinator of Fossil Free Tompkins. As an activist, she's one of those rare people that is both visionary and very detail-oriented. So whenever I walk this world with Irene, I always feel like I'm looking through the lens of a camera that can be at the one minute like a telephoto lens and a telescope, and the next minute I'm looking at a microscope at the very details of, uh, of policy making. So that's the world that uh, Irene inhabits. Next, then, we'll hear from Karen Edelstein, who is a geographer and a resident of Lansing. And her genius is to turn data into visual narratives through the magic of maps. Um, and uh, she, uh, in that capacity, works uh, for an amazing shop called Frat Tracker. And I won't even try to describe it with words. You'll see it in, in images in a minute. Uh, and then, closing us out, will be uh, Katie Quinn Jacobs, a resident of Dryden, representing today Mothers Out Front Tompkins. Uh, in the quote that Katie provided me for the media today, she gave me a quote that made me shiver. So part of it says, 
It's our solemn duty to protect our children. Uh, and that uh, reminds us why uh, climate change is, a, is an issue of parenting, as, as Katie reminds us. So with that, uh, here we begin uh, with our amazing speakers. Uh, and Vera, you have the floor. Oh, housekeeping, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, two exits, one on each side, should you need them. Bathrooms are over here. Um, and then one piece of housekeeping that I think we should always say is that we're on Cayuga land here. Yes. So, uh, and, yes. and we should keep that in our hearts and minds as we watch. Um, to say more about that later, um, we have a couple of uh, amazing resource people who you'll hear from in the rally that I want to point out. Uh, uh, Joe Heath is here, who's the general counsel for Onondaga Nation. Joe, can you, I don't see where you are, where are you? Stand up, there he is. genius of law um, to our forum. And we also have uh, Dr. Robert Howard, one of the uh, foremost methane experts in the world, ecologist at Cornell. <laughs> You'll be hearing from both of these gentlemen at the rally, but they're here to be a resource person as we begin to ask uh, questions. So if we have questions about methane science, questions about law, um, here, here are our resident experts. And now, uh, Vera. I'm going to try and use this, okay. Um, I'm from Susquehanna County. It's always difficult a little bit to uh, start the story for me uh, because it brings up tears for me. Uh, I live in the gas fields of Pennsylvania, uh, just south of Binghamton, New York. I didn't move to the gas fields. I didn't bring my children or, or my pets to the gas fields. I lived in uh, Long Island, New York, Nassau County, and I moved there about 27 years ago. And there was no industry to speak of. I moved to get clean air, clean water, and a rural environment. And 17 years later, just out of the blue, the industry came in. There's no zoning to speak of. We're a rural community, 45,000 people. And uh, they started drilling. They started bringing rigs on farms. My friends showed me the farms in Dimmick, where they started, and I was in shock and very disturbed. And I said, I have to document this. I must show the world what is happening here. So I'm a videographer, I'm a photographer, I'm a writer. And I started to document. And now I have over 800 videos showing the process over 10 years. We have been assaulted for 10 years. We have this next to our homes within 300 to 500 feet. There is no minimum distance for compressor stations next to our homes. There's no minimum distance for pipelines next to our homes. The pipelines have been increasing from 10 inches to now 36 inches and also 42 is uh, being proposed, 42 inches. High pressure, super high pressure pipelines. So from what you can see, lots of trees being cut down, lots of swatches, hundreds of miles of new pipelines just in my county. We are now up to 1,600 gas wells, 1,600 holes throughout the county. Um, 52, now you need also processing, you need all kinds of infrastructure. We are now up to 52 compressor stations scattered throughout the county from three to five miles apart. So if you can picture the Dominion in Dryden, we have 52 of those in our county, belching out all kinds of toxic air. You can see the tops, this is a compressor station at night, one of our main ones. And the noise is continual industrial sound. I was there last night taking that photograph, but, and it's right next to one of our cemeteries. 
where one of my friends is buried who died from cancer. She used to work at Bendix in our county, which is now a super fun site. It's still being cleaned up. So whatever she was exposed to, and she died in her 50s. So this is happening now, and now we have a new phenomenon. It never ends. They keep adding new things, power plants, treatment plants, impoundments to hold the waste. The truck traffic is all kinds of truck traffic. To, to make this happen. They're still, tr they're still fracking, they're still drilling. They have over a thousand violations. DEP, we have a Department of uh, Environmental Protection, like you have DEC. <coughs> over a thousand violations just in my county, and they're still allowed to operate. That's mind-boggling to me. I keep asking them, why are they operating? What other company has these kind of privileges? Are, is this like a special, sacred, cow in our, in our country, we can't say anything against it because the few that make lots of money on it. So now we have this new phenomenon, XNG, it's compressed gas trucks. So it's like a virtual pipeline, 22,000 pounds of gas in each truck. They have two uh, turbines there two engines that are belching out toxins all day long, 24-7. This company operates 24-7. They were operating on Labor Day. I passed them on the road. They live near my home. They're a few miles from my house. I have to pass this road, and then I smell the gas. I smell the Mercaptan, the odorizer they put in the gas that's leaking from the trucks and from the site. So they are operating on our country roads. They're windy, hilly country roads, just like you have here. They put a, that's a, see that wall there, that beige wall? That's a noise abatement wall that was requested because they failed the noise ordinance. We actually have a noise ordinance. It's amazing, we actually do it for the county. 50 decibels, they failed it, so they put up the wall and they passed. But it's super noisy still. I put my little noise meter out there last night. It was between 55 and 65 decibels. They're over it. But the county is doing nothing about it. This is next to a lake community, Forest Lake. This is um, surrounded by homes, and it has to pass schools. It, has to pa it did pass one of my children's schools. My children have recently moved about a year and a half ago from the area. But they were going to school there. My grandchildren, I have three children, three, two grandchildren. So they fill these trucks. These are now going into New York up to some, from 60 to 100 trucks a day into New York to bring gas to Mannheim. I followed the trucks. It took me two and a half hours to go to this place called Mannheim. And then there they are, they go there and then they deliver to some businesses and then they also pump it into the Iroquois pipeline. When I asked them where that was going, they said Long Island. So you can see the emissions on the top of there. This is happening now in your state. So we've been warning, I've been trying to warn people about this before this was built a year and a half ago. So now it's built, it's approved by our planning commission. They basically approve just about anything. So I'm asking for help. The more gas that's being used in this, in New York, in New England, the more we have to be fracked. We are one of 30 counties in Pennsylvania alone that's being fracked. They're drilling us. They have no end in sight. We have now 1,600 wells. Their plan is at least 4,000 wells just for our county. And then you have about 30 states west of us that are being fracked for this fossil fuel. We are at risk. Our health, our air, our water, we have Dozens of families who can't drink their water. And it's been verified by the DEP. And this is across Pennsylvania. We have dozens and dozens of people suffering. They have to truck in their water. So I'm telling you right now, whatever you can do to stop them from coming into New York. Also, I just found out two weeks ago, two more companies are coming into my county to do exactly this. They want to replicate this. 
And one of the companies was kicked out of Fenton, New York. You might know about the story. There was a big to-do about it about the past year. The citizens rose up in New York. New Yorkers are fighters. My children were born in New York. I lived in Long Island for about 20 years. And my grandchildren were born in New York. Uh, from what I see, New York is <coughs> fighters. Pennsylvania, I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> Either the exposure to all kinds of fossil fuels, all kinds of industry, something has happened to their spirit. They just accept things. They say to me over and over again, when I say things like I'm concerned about this, very concerned, it is what it is. <laughs> That's a line. I mean, I never heard that line, believe me, in New York. I never heard it in Long Island. I didn't, I didn't grow up with it. I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, another toxic industrial town. And I escaped that town when I got married. But they say it is what it is, so they just allow. So I, I hope there's no more allowance because we've got two more companies, which means hundreds of more trucks going towards New York and New England. And the, the uh, possibility of explosion, they've had several accidents already, at least half a dozen rollovers. They, they're holding compressed gas at very high pressures, 36 PSI, very high pressure, 3600, very high pressures. So if anything happens like that, and going through your areas, your towns, your children, your schools, your families, I pray it doesn't happen. But we need to get off fossil fuels and let's do the alternatives that are safe and truly green. And nobody has to be harmed. None of us have to be sacrificed. Penn State, Mr. Engelder, Professor Engelder, mm -hmm. told us to our face mm -hmm. in, in uh, public meetings, you are a sacrifice zone. And he thought that was okay. Some have to be sacrificed, he said, so that others and everyone can have energy. I don't believe that. Terry Engelder, right? Yes, Terry Engelder. Yep. And he came to our county a couple of times, even came on one of my tours. I do citizen guest tours. I've done hundreds of them for people five, from five continents around the world to show them what's happening to us so that others are warned and you don't do it elsewhere. So this is no more sacrifice. Let's do it right. We can do it. We've been talking about it since the 60s. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony and for bearing, uh, after you, well, bear speaks truth to power, but also speaks truth to the powerless when she brings her talks into communities not yet fracked who are on the front lines. And we oh, honor my great that. pleasure to uh, introduce uh, my boss and all this. <laughs> I remind <laughs> good, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your Saturday uh, to join us in standing up for the climate and for justice and for jobs. Um, not the kind of jobs that they're bringing to Pennsylvania, but clean energy jobs. Uh, there are some empty seats that I see around here, and I see a bunch of people standing. So if there's an empty seat next to you, you want to raise your hand, and anybody that wants to come sit, come sit. Wow, you guys are hardcore. All right. <laughs> All right, so, so I'm Irene Weiser, the coordinator of uh, Fossil Free Tompkins, and uh, this is round two for many of us. Uh, some years ago, the Kiva Power Plant uh, made an effort to uh, convert to burning natural gas. At that time, they wanted us, nice customers, to pay for that conversion. Uh, we, we, and I look at many of you in this room, it really was an enormous effort and so many people joined in to tell the Public Service Commission, no, we don't want frac gas here, we, we don't want to support that. Um, and uh, the, the Public Service Commission did agree with us. Now, the Cuban power plant on their own, not looking for a handout from us this time, but just using their own money, are planning once again to convert to burning frac gas. And so this is 
going to be a presentation that gives you a little bit of a history of what's going on and, uh, and then gets into looking at their proposal and the implications for this community and beyond. And, and honestly, the whole time that we think about the implications right here, whether it's the trucks and the traffic on our roads or whether it's the tax impacts if the power plant closes, I want you to also think about the impacts if it continues on Vera and her neighborhoods in Pennsylvania. Because we're all on here. This is this is this is something that affects everybody. So this is literally an overview of uh, the property of the Cuga power plant. Uh, it's bounded basically by these roads that you see here, uh, 430 odd acres. This, what you see up here, both the green area and this grayish area is a 42 acre coal ash pile. Uh, down here, right at the edge of the lake, is the power plant and their coal pile. Uh, and the coal gets delivered by train coming up. Uh, coming up the lake, so some of you have probably uh, seen, seen that before. Over here is a water tank that I believe was brought in, uh, which you can't see in this picture. Let me just go back for a second. You can see here that just down, uh, this is a little bit to the south of the plant, there's actually a neighborhood of people who live uh, on the lake. And um, the uh, this... Uh, Water tank here, I believe, was brought in to provide water to these residents down here uh, because of concerns of, of possible contamination. So the power plant was built in the mid-1950s. It has two what are called generating units. Um, so it, in a way, it's two side-by-side -side power plants, one that is rated at 150 megawatts and the other at 167. They're very creatively called Unit 1 and Unit 2. Um, as I said, 434 acres. For those of you that have been around here for a while, you'll know that uh, this power plant went by many names over the years. It started out being called Millican Station when it was owned by NYSEG. Then in 1998, New York State um, deregulated and said that uh, companies couldn't own both the generation and the distribution networks. And so uh, NYSEG had to sell off all of their generating units. They sold them off to AES. This one was called AES Cayuga. Um, then in 2012, uh, well actually in 2011, they declared bankruptcy. And in 2012, they were bought um, by the upstate New York power producers. Um, and then went by still the name Cayuga Power Plant. And then uh, just a couple of years ago, in 2016, May of 2016, uh, they were sold once again to a company called Hera. Um, in 2012, after um, they declared bankruptcy, they, they, they were bought out, and then they applied to what's called mothball, saying that they were uneconomic to operate. But the state told them that they couldn't close uh, because of what was called a reliability concern, that, that uh, there were areas, and I'll show you this in the next slide, um, that needed power from the plant. Uh, but the, that was taken care of. That was our first fight uh, with this plant. And the reliability concerns were addressed by fixing the, the grid, which is the right kind of investment, because that's an investment in the future, not an investment into a change of plant from coal to gas, which would have been an investment in the past. So, so, um, so the plant was converted, or sorry, the, the transmission lines were fixed. And uh, during that time, the reliability concern we paid a subsidy to keep the plant operating. Uh, it was about $4 million a month for all of that time. It totaled $188 million that every nice customer had a surcharge on their bill for all that time to, uh, to uh, keep the plant operating. We paid for their payroll, we paid for their fuel, we paid their taxes that they paid to the town. Um, quite a hand out, quite a boondoggle. And they got to keep $5 million a year of profit as a base, and then 50, and then 50 percent of any profit over five million that they made during that time. We still haven't gotten an accounting from the state yet about um, how those monies were spent. Um, so, so this is a, a map of the power grid in New York State, uh, and up here is Lake Ontario, and on Lake Ontario, uh, off to the east here. There are a couple of very major nuclear plants, along with a very large gas power plant. And so what you can see are these very big, uh, or, well, not big, but, but they're, they're power lines that, that really 
take the, the major load of power from the state and run it basically down the I-81 corridor. Um, what was happening, here's, here's our lake and the Cuga power plant, as it to the south. Um, up in Auburn, uh, there's, a, there's a plant there that recycles steel and they use a lot of, a lot of energy, both a lot of electricity and a lot of gas. Uh, and during the really hot summer months, uh, when, when people were turning on their air conditioning and whatever else, that load of that, that new core steel recycling mill plus all the air conditioners was threatening to, to cause this power line from, from these major supply lines into Auburn to overheat. And so until that transmission line was fixed, the Cayuga plant was needed. They happened to have a power line that runs up to Auburn. And so for those four years, um, the Cayuga plant was, was required to operate even though they were uneconomic. And uh, we paid to keep them operating to make sure that Auburn had power when they needed it on hot days. Um, meanwhile, back in 2010, in anticipation that this power plant could at some point close, uh, the the NYSEG and the Public Service Commission agreed that they should upgrade the power lines into Ithaca. Uh, again, these same red lines that you can see here, providing the main power supply. So in 2010, this was fixed, and in 2017, this was fixed. So now, as far as I'm aware, there is no actual need for the power from this plant anymore. We've got um, adequate supply coming in, honestly, from much you know, larger sources. So I'm not going to get into detail here, but this is the coal ash pile that I mentioned to you. Uh, there have been there's a group called Ash Tracker uh, that that monitors the, the uh, groundwater contamination from uh, ash piles around uh, the, the country, and uh, this is their assessment of, of the uh, problems that are occurring in, in uh, Cuba. So Cuba has to report, I think it's on a quarterly basis, maybe even monthly, um, different uh, groundwater samples from a bunch of test wells. And so what's been found is that 50 of 55 groundwater monitoring wells have been polluted above the federal advisory levels um, on samples that were collected between 2010 and 2015. Uh, there are continuing tests that have been done. They haven't made it onto this map yet. And I think there's a group that has uh, been uh, requesting the data for, for subsequent years. Um, but the contaminants are really ugly. Boron, molybdenum, uh, manganese sulfate, strontium, arsenic, selenium, thallium, um, lead, cobalt, um, so bad stuff, and mercury. In addition, you can see here, this is what's called the leachate pond. This collects the groundwater that runs off of the, uh, the coal ash pile and also collects rainwater. It gets released directly into Cuyahoga Lake from time to time. Um, they release some 25 million gallons of uh, leachate mixed with rainwater every year into the lake, untreated. This is uh, something that happened. Oh, where did my there it is. There are two emergency incidents at the Cuba power plant during the time that it was on our subsidy. Uh, one occurred in January of 2015, where generator unit one, uh, my understanding is there was a fin from the generator that tore off and went whipping through the plant, um, caused a lot of inside damage, uh, causing the plant to be out of service for eight months. In uh, April 6th of 2016, there was a fire in unit two um, in what they call the stack, or what we would maybe call the chimney or the smokestack. Um, that, that stack fire was also pretty severe. Uh, it put the emission controls, uh, uh, scrubbers that they were installing uh, were irreparably damaged, and in fact the whole stack has been very damaged. There's, there's actually a third stack that you can't usually see in pictures, um, and that's called the bypass stack, and that's when they've been using generator two, they've been operating it through the bypass. Um, but they were uh, notified, this is weird, some of my slides are coming up funny, sorry you guys. Um, so uh, they, were, they were notified uh, by uh, the, the New York ISO and the DEC 
that, um, that they were having emission issues out of Unit 2, and that was of this year, so just, just a little while ago, they were required by the state to shut down Unit 2. Um, as a result of being required to shut it down, they, uh, they had a couple of options that they could, they could either shut it down, um, they could put a scrubber in, or they could convert to burning gas. And so in late April, they applied to the Department of Environmental Conservation to convert Unit 2 to burning gas. So, so this is a summary of uh, the contents of their application to the DEC. Um, it's called a modification of their Title V air emission permit. They proposed two different scenarios. Uh, one scenario would just apply to Unit 2, and that's the one we'll be focusing on today. The other was to, and, and it was going to be to convert Unit 2 to burn gas. The other scenario was to convert Unit 1 and 2 to, to burn gas. Um, in regards to Unit 2, they expect the permit approval within a year, um, and they expect to operate the plant at what's called 77% capacity or capacity factor. So what that means, remember we, we talked about at the beginning that, that there was one unit that was rated at 155 and the other 160 whatever, 167, thank you. <laughs> um, what it means is that, uh, that if they were operating at 100% capacity, it would mean that they were operating at 167 megawatts um, every single day, 24-7 for the entire year, and that would be considered 100% capacity. Um, typically, uh, so, so that 155 and 167 are what are called nameplate capacities. No plant ever operates right at, right at the top of, of their game um, for various uh, you know, equipment reasons for efficiency. So, so the actual operating efficiency of, of Unit 2 is right around 150 megawatts. It's not up at the 167. Um, but so anyhow, they're they're saying that they would only that they would be able to operate at 77 percent capacity factor. You'll see how this becomes relevant um, later on in the talk. So I just wanted to, to give you a little bit of detail on that. Uh, they say that Unit Two construction would begin in uh, March 2019, and here's the real shocker: is that they would be delivering the gas to the plant by truck. Uh, they say that Unit One they would con continue to burn coal for now. Uh, the DEC, meanwhile, has proposed a rule to stop any use of coal uh, for power generation in New York by 2020. Um, so they, they are proposing also in, in their uh, application that um, if and when they convert Unit 1 to gas, that they might put a pipeline. But um, I think they said that all of it depends on market conditions and the economics at that point in time. So again, uh, Cuba's proposal, proposal for scenario one is to bring the gas in by trucks. And you guys saw that the compressor station, we believe, that would be trucking it in. One thing to notice about these trucks, um, and this is specific in Cuba's proposal, which is why we believe it would be this company, um, is that this truck doesn't have the usual you know, emission stack for diesel. So these would be um, trucks that are powered by natural gas along with carting natural gas in their trailer. Um, and so, so that's their proposal. And uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Karen Edelstein from Frack Tracker to uh, continue with the saga of the trucks. Huh. OK, so we've heard from Vera what the impacts on communities are in Pennsylvania of these trucks coming through. And we're also hearing a lot from nearby counties like uh, Oneont around Oneonta where CNG trucks are also still plying the roads there. So it was really up to, it was really my, my curiosity to think about if the trucks were going to be coming up from the same facility in Forest Lake near where Vera lives and coming up to Lansing, what might that look like? So my work with Frack Tracker Alliance, um, I've been with this organization for about eight years now, and we look on a very broad <coughs> scale across the U.S. and internationally about the impacts of oil and gas on 
human health and also environmental health. And so while I do a lot of work in New York, it was really, um, it was hard to turn away from this with the skills that I have to also take a look at what was going on just a few miles from my home right here in Lansing. So there are a few different configurations of these natural gas trucks um, if you look online um, and also talking with people out in the field. The trucks that are coming up um, through Veer's community are largely tanks that are arranged vertically and they're depending on the size of the truck. There are about 50 some odd vertical canisters, but you can also see these trucks on the road, not in box trucks, but but carrying these, um, these cylindrical canisters that are arranged um, horizontally. And again, as Irene was saying, they're under quite high pressure, around 3,600 PSI. And that's the, the trucks similar, more similar to the XNG trucks um, that with the, with the um, vertical orientation. They're very, very highly engineered trucks um, designed not to explode, um, but there are, there, it's really not a proven um, technology because it is really so, so very, very new. But they are truck, the trucks are different than what you would expect from a truck that was hauling, say, cargo for Wegmans. So the safety issue is really a concern. There have been rollovers, there have been spontaneous venting events, there have been more rollovers, there have been trucks that have slid back, slid backwards down roads. They are not without problems at all. And again, these are on, sometimes on state highways, sometimes on more rural county roads. Um, and these are the, just the events in the, in the new, generally in the New York area, but a few in Pennsylvania. And just a few pictures. So here's the truck that fell off the road. Here it is in the ditch. And the question I think that also has not been discussed at all is what, if this did happen in New York State, what would be the, the emergency response training for these up to 120 trucks a day that might be coming back and forth on 34B through Lansing. We have not heard anything about that either. Can I back up for just a second? Just a little bit more detail on these rollovers. Um, this is, this is, you see these little dots all across the roof of this truck? So this is a truck that has uh, vertically oriented uh, cylinders containing the gas. And, and as Karen described, they're, they're in these really like super fine carbon fiber things that make Kevlar look fragile as toilet paper. I mean, these are just really solid tanks that they're in. The weak points in them is, is the vents um, and, and the connection to the vents. These dots along the top, whoops, these dots along the top are, um, are where the uh, truck would vent things. Those, those are the emergency vents. What I want to have you look at is this truck here that flipped completely over mm -hmm. onto its top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was not able to be vented. The recommended emergency procedure on these trucks is that when they do, if and when they do flip or roll, um, that if they're carrying a load that they should be vented before um, they're moved. Um, venting is not an easy process. Uh, you guys have probably had, all had the experience of holding a can of spray paint or you know, or that duster for your keyboards, and and when you you know hold it for a while, it gets really cold. Um, same thing happens here. When the gas expands, uh, the canisters get really cold, and the gas gets really cold, and it actually settles. Um, her descriptions of of it settling in sort of this crystalline, bubbly stuff um, down low before eventually it does evaporate. Um, and going back here. Uh, at the very bottom here, I don't know if everybody can see, there was a, a rollover uh, just this past month in July in Exeter, uh, which is in Otsego County. Uh, they had to vent the gas from that truck after it rolled over. Uh, the recommendation is to evacuate for a half a mile. Uh, they evacuated for a quarter of a mile. 
It ended up uh, resulting in the road being closed for 12 hours. Uh, similarly, up here on uh, the top, the spontaneous venting in Binghamton, uh, the road was closed for quite a while as, as they managed the venting there. Um, so, sorry to jump in on that. But, uh, all right, oh, and, and these are, yeah, these are, these are uh, a couple of reports that, that we have about the rollovers. Uh, this was a rollover police report from the, in Pennsylvania. Uh, what's really interesting, we've heard, and you know, I, I have no way, I'm not a trucker, I have no way to verify this, but what I've heard is that these trucks are uh, unsteady and top heavy, and that they flip and, and feel, you know, unsteady on the road more often. And, and you can actually see some videos online, I don't know if Vera is one of the ones who made them, where you can actually see the, the whole sort of, uh, trailer tottering around. But anyhow, this is, this is a report uh, from Pennsylvania where gas was released. Um, and they describe it as the truck was traveling north and came upon a curve in the roadway. Um, unit, the truck was attempting to negotiate the curve it, to the right in the roadway. The operator lost control, couldn't correct the trailer on the unit, and then it, it tipped over. Um, and then it goes on to describe that the, the police report describes that um, that the truck sustained moderate trailer damage and its load and its load which was carrying natural gas. The damage caused natural gas to leak out of the container. So again, the, the containers themselves are solid. I mean, they really are. They're, they're made of this super fiber carbon stuff. But but there are weak links and leaks do occur, um, which is a concern. Uh, this is, uh, I, I met a, a, a council member from, from a town board in Otsego County uh, where this Exeter truck had rolled over. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a note that he sent to me that he wanted to take a moment to share his concern uh, in, in the town of Otsego um, that they've had two truck rollovers in their town, uh, including uh, in the incident that we talked about already, residents within a quarter of a mile of the rollover site had to be evacuated because much of the gas contained in the truck was released to the atmosphere. This process closed the state highway in, in 20, Highway 28 in Exeter for over 12 hours, causing major delays in Cooperstown and the regional trauma center lo located there, the Bassett Hospital. Uh, so it's, it's this council member's opinion that it's only a matter of time before most serious accidents happen. Um, additionally, neighbors up and down these roadways have to put up with a lot more noise, lights, shaking homes, and increased worry over safety due to this truck traffic. All right, so now Karen, back, back to the Karen, back to the maps. We're very collaborative. <laughs> So I did ask this question, what would be the impact if those 25 to 60 truck trips or 50 to 120 trucks going, if you count round trips, going through our neighborhoods and just looking mostly at, from the Pennsylvania border all the way up to the, to the Lansing power plant. So what I kept in mind was this half mile known evacuation zone and considered what were the facilities, the schools, daycare centers that were located within that area and exactly what was the population based on the most recent census data for the number of people who were in that potential evacuation zone. So there are a lot of different routes that the trucks could take. I tried to err on the side of being conservative about this and just assuming that reason would prevail for these 80,000 pound trucks carrying this cargo and that they would most likely stick to the better constructed state highways and federal highways and interstates. So here's one trip that seemed to be the first one to look at. This would have the truck traffic coming up from Pennsylvania, taking Route 17, coming up through Cander, and then following Route 34, 96, and 13 around the city of Ithaca, and then coming up 34, 
B to Lansing. This is one of the least impactful trips, although it does go right through the Route 13 corridor downtown. It would pass the homes of over 36,000 people in the towns that you can see 17 health care facilities, 20 daycare centers, four private schools, and 21 public schools. So that's within a half a mile of that, that roadway. I think it's important to ask yourself, what if the truck did go over, and what would be the implications of evacuation and lack of access to those hospitals? How would those students in, let's just say, for example, the Lansing Elementary School, the Lansing Middle School, the Lansing High School, how would they be instantaneously evacuated in the middle of a school day? Have to think about that. How would daycare centers full of little kids, how would senior facilities filled with people who might be in wheelchairs be able to evacuate? That's what's on my mind. Here's another option. Again, coming up from Pennsylvania, this time going east on 17, taking that big strong highway 81 all the way to the north, through Cortland, and across, and 34, and up through Lansing. This one would go past the homes of over 54,000 people, 31 healthcare facilities, 37 daycare centers, three private schools, 19 public schools, and within the city limits of Cortland and Binghamton. Here's one that goes right through the village of Dryden, coming across 79 up through 38, and again continuing up 34B. Again, you know, almost two dozen healthcare facilities and daycare centers, a dozen public schools and a private school. This was one that was particularly interesting to me to model because we know that at some point in the next two years, the big bridge on um, 34B, just north of the middle school, is going to be closed for repairs. And so truck traffic at that point would not be coming from the south. It would be coming diverted from the north to the Cuba Power Plant, cutting across Route 90, which, as you all probably know, is a very, very hilly and steep road with a few pretty dramatic curves on it, and so that brings to mind the report that Irene just, um, just did read. But again, you can read this for yourself. It's always a couple of dozen healthcare facilities, a dozen schools. It varies from place to place, but our state highways go through very highly populated areas. Here's another one. Um, that cuts across Route 79, again, following the Route 81 corridor for a little ways. Oops. And so I, I created an interactive piece, which I, I would love it if, if we have time at the end of this session today, as Vanna is indicating. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are maps behind Irene that show, um, that you can pick up and look at for each of these slides, but I've made a composite map um, on the easel next to Irene, and there are little dots with uh, sticky backed with numbers on them. And what I'd like anybody who's interested in doing this, grab a, one of those dots, stick it on the map near where you think some of those highways that could be carrying the truck traffic go where you would commute to work, or your children would go on school buses, or you might be biking or walking. And then right in front of the easel, there are little postcard-sized pieces of paper where we'd like you to just describe in a little bit more detail. And I'll create an interactive map that will be a collective, ongoing, kind of crowdsourced piece of information so we as a community can register what our concerns are. This is not hypothetical. This is going through our communities where it's going to personally impact our everyday life. It's also pretty interesting, um, 
this, this map, this was included in Lansing's comprehensive plan that was just approved last year, but there was a study that was done in the fall of 2014 that looked at the locations of the highest severity and highest um, uh, worst crash rates with, with most frequency. And so just zooming in on Lansing, Here's the intersection at the Cayuga Power Plant. If you look down here, this is the intersection coming up Route 34. This is Rogues Harbor. Here's uh, the intersection of Brickyard Hill. And then here we have the schools and another one of those curves that brings to mind that question of what happens when the trucks need to negotiate those curves right in front of the schools. Something to think about. Um, there's also, there's been a, a fair amount of debate about how much impact truck traffic, additional truck traffic to the Lansing area, um, what that might mean. So there was, again, a DOT, Department of Transportation, count that was done in 2015. And I pulled out the data for the section of the road just from Rogues Harbor up to uh, Lansingville Road, and then the power plant is um, just south of here. Um, on a typical, typical day, there's about 3,900 vehicles of all types that go along this road. Typically, going eastbound, that's this way, there are 42 trucks a day that are going there. My guess is the eastbound route is different from the westbound route, which only has 17 trucks, because these are a lot of trucks that are coming out of Cargill. These are heavy, five-axle trucks, five sets of wheels, carrying heavy, heavy loads. Um, the peaks in that traffic are between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. So it doesn't seem like a lot to add 60 to maybe 120 trucks to a number like this, 3,900 or 3,500. But I think it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's false to minimize that because it's not the total number of vehicles that we're looking at. What we're looking at are the number of heavy trucks, the trucks that can cause damage to the roads, the trucks that have harder time negotiating curves, the trucks that could tip over, the tr trucks that could cause damage to other vehicles. So this was a report um, that we did read in Cuba's press release that talked about, oh, it's only a one or two percent change in traffic if these trucks continue delivering or start delivering to the Puga power plant. But it's not about all number of vehicles. That is simply bad math to do. The change in the heavy trucks would be a difference of 85 to over 200 percent increase. So do not allow yourselves to be placated by that figure of one to two percent. It's just not good math. So that's all I have to say right now. I'm going to pass it back to Irene. Feel free to get in touch with me for the graphics or more information. So, uh, San Sandra introduced me as, as somebody who can take a big picture and also get way lost in the weeds. So, so bear lost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but into the weeds. So, so bear with me on this slide because um, this is this is one of the my trips into the weeds, and um, and I wanted to check. You know, we 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 learned that the uh, the the number of trucks. Uh, was was uh, represented uh, in a way that probably wasn't a fair way to represent it. It made me wonder 
are, you know, what are the actual number of trucks per day? Is it really going to be this 25 to 60 trucks, which again, that's 50 to 120 truck trips per day. Um, so I started looking at, at some data that you can get uh, from the EPA, and actually it was very handy that Cayuga put it into their application to show over the years um, that they've been operating on the subsidy and up until now, uh, what has their, remember I talked about that term capacity factor? What has their capacity factor been uh, o over the years? And uh, so this starts in 2013, which is when the subsidy started. And it goes all the way to the end to, um, to what is it, May, May or June of uh, 2018. Um, but these, these orange bars represent the capacity factor for any given month of the year. And so what you can see, even when they were on subsidy, January and February, they were operating, you know, pretty high capacity. March and April, not really at all. There's nothing. May, hardly anything. June, they were at 15%. You know, so it's quite variable, the capacity factor that they were operating in any given month. You can also see, this is, I should say, this is just for unit two. This isn't taking unit one into account. You can also see um, after the fire, so, so through until, what is it, J the end of uh, July of 2017, so over here, they were still on subsidy. But you can see that after the fire, which happened in, I think it was May of uh, 2016, that they operated a lot less in this window of time, even though they were still on subsidy. And that's because the staff wasn't operative and they were using the bypass, which had no, no pollution controls. And so they, they probably only did it when it was particularly profitable for them to, to operate. Um, but so anyhow, there's quite a lot of variability in any given month as to how much they operate. Then these dots represent, and the, the, it's over here, these dots represent um, the number of days per month that they operate. And so you end up in situations like this where they're operating um, less than 30 days, but it, at 90% capacity. Well, that, what that suggests is during that month, they didn't even operate every day that month. Um, so they must have been really uh, using, you know, bringing a much higher capacity factor during the days that they were operating. And, and so, so it's been really interesting to, to look at that. And then also to look at when a capacity factor is reported um, on an annual basis. So uh, they, they had reported in, in 2013 that they were operating at 29% capacity for the year. Um, and you can see that, that you know, there were, there were months where they were, where they were really right up there. And it's nowhere, you know, it's not anywhere as, it's just because down here, they weren't operating much at all. So the average over the year might be 29%, or in 2014, 37%. But uh, during the months that they're operating, they're operating and probably bringing in a lot more trucks. So, um, so that the idea that, that it's going to be 25 to 60 trucks um, becomes questionable and, and it suggests that during the times that they're operating, there'll be a lot more, but average will be 25 to 60. But, you know, average includes a whole bunch of months where they might not even be operating at all. Um, so I, I then um, went a little bit further and uh, took that graph that I just showed you, took, took what we know of annual capacity factor, and uh, this is uh, thanks to the assistance of uh, Tony and Graffia to, to figure out how do you calculate how many trucks it would be depending on the, on the capacity factor. And so this is on a, you know, if this is on a day by day basis, the number of trucks. Uh, so if they were operating at, you know, 30% that day it would be 27 trucks in, which would be 54 truck trips. Um, if they're operating at 60%, it's 54 trucks or 108 truck trips. Um, so, so you can see that, you know, and as we know, that there's, you know, these times where they're operating at very high capacity, but not nearly every day during the month, 
So they're probably operating on those days closer to the 90 or 100 percent capacity, which could put us at, at 90 trucks a day or 180 truck trips a day. Um, so shifting gears here, it's you know, in this in this era of climate change, it's it all comes down to the emissions, doesn't it? Um, so. So this is, this is part of their application. And what they describe here, this, this, whoops, this top line talks about the emissions that they currently have right now of uh, sulfur dioxide, of the nitric oxides, carbon dioxide, which we all know is one of the, the major global warming gases, carbon monoxide. Um, these guys, which I haven't looked at, I didn't get into the weeds on those. Um, and then over here, CO2e. That is the carbon dioxide equivalents. So um, one of the things that I suspect some of you in the room know about and some don't is that methane, which is the major component of natural gas, is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, at least in the short term. So in the short term, in the next 20 years or so, which is what, about what we have time for to turn this thing around and save, save, save the humans, right? The planet will keep going, but we may not. Um, the, the, the global warming potential of methane in the next 20 years is 96 times as potent as carbon dioxide. So that means that when there's methane that's leaking at the drilling sites and leaking from the compressor stations, as you saw, and leaking uh, in the transportation, um, and probably leaking when they plug these trucks in to feed the gas into the power plant, that, that all of those leaks um, have a really significant impact on our climate. Um, and so, so that's what the CO2e column is. Now, here's, here's where it gets really funky. So this is what they're projecting their actual emissions will be. And remember, we just saw that, that they were operating um, at, what was it, between 29 and 37% capacity factor. Remember, their, their new application is to operate at 77% capacity factor. So they want to, you know, this graph, double it. It's going to be, some, you know, sometimes they're already um, at, at high number of days, you know, the full number of days per month, but maybe they're going to be operating at higher power. Um, some, some months when they're not operating now, they anticipate that when they're using gas, they will be able to operate. So, so this now talks about the projected actual emissions once they convert this unit to burning gas. Now you can see that sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxides all decline, and, and they show that across this yellow bar here. Um, but really interesting to see that, that when they double their, uh, their level of operation up to 77% capacity factor, they could be emitting even more carbon dioxide than they currently were. Um, and similarly, come across here, the uh, CO2 equivalents go up, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then this is also really interesting for everybody who talks about gas being cleaner than coal. It's true that gas doesn't put out the sulfurs and the nitric oxides, um, doesn't put the mercury in the air, and, and you know certainly cleaner in that respect. But in terms of the volatile organic compounds, gas puts out more VOCs than coal. And VOCs are the precursor to smog. So won't that be lovely to start having smog across Key Lake and through Lansing and into Trumansburg? So, so that's um, what we're looking at, is that, that they anticipate operating more, um, twice, twice the level of operation that they, they would currently have. Um, because if you look down here as to how they calculated what the carbon dioxide equivalents would be, they're using very old numbers. They're using numbers that were recommended back in 2007. Um, by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And that looked at a 100-year time frame of global warming impact. We don't have 100 years, folks. We have 20 years. A 100-year time frame, 
the global warming impact of methane is 25 times that of CO2. But we're now, we're looking, they should be using a different multiplier here. They should be using 96, which puts the, the, the CO2 equivalent impact at four times as high as what they have here. So, um, so we got we got trouble with this uh, application. This is probably the most important graph you'll ever see. Um, this is the graph about, in terms of understanding why we're so hot on the trail of methane. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to go through this because it's really important to get this graph. Um, over here on this axis, on the x, on the y axis, is the amount of temperature change that, that we can afford to go through. And I think that many of you know that the ideal would be to keep it less than 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature change. Um, if we get above 2 degrees change, we're really in, in what's considered the danger zone, where there become all of these um, uh, vicious cycles of things that just can't stop. So, you know, the, the permafrost melts and re releases more methane, which then causes more planetary warming, which then causes more methane from the permafrost to be released. And there's all, all kinds of vicious cycles that start to occur um, once we get over, over two degrees warming. But so I want you to look out here. So, so this, is, this is the level of, um, of warming that the planet has experienced over time from 1900. And these are 10 year increments. So, so here, this purple line, the one that's labeled reference, is if we do, don't do anything. Here's where we're headed, okay? And so this is 2000, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So, so we are fast approaching, and these red dots show where we actually are in terms of the temperature. So, so the, the curve is not, you know, we're, we're, we're going faster than the predicted curve. Um, the, this red line, this arc, is what happens if we stop releasing as much CO2 into the atmosphere. And you can see that, that it, it doesn't do anything in terms of preventing us getting to the 1.5 crossover point. Um, it does help some years out, 30, 40 years out, it does start to bend the curve a little bit and slow things down. Remember I talked about the half-life of, oh, maybe I didn't talk about that. But the half, so, so here's now, let me, let me come back and look at this graph again. Looking at um, the, this line, this green line, if we reduce carbon dioxide and methane and what's called black carbon or soot, which comes out of burning diesel and, and other things, if we reduce all of that, you can see that the, the crossover point to get to 1.5 degrees, we, we actually buy ourselves some time. We actually buy ourselves some time if we cut out the methane. And the reason that that happens is because, remember there was that difference, if you look at 100 years of methane, it's only 25 times as potent. But, but if you look at 20 years, it's, it's 100 times as potent. That's because the half-life of methane is pretty short. And so, you know, within 20 years, a lot of the methane that's up in the atmosphere is gone. Um, so the good news, if, if we take the right actions and take them soon, is that if we can stop fracking and stop using gas, we, we buy ourselves some time um, for, for um, forestalling some of the worst effects of global warming. So, bringing it back home to Lansing, there's of course a lot of concern about if this plant closes, they pay a lot of property taxes here. And so what, what are the, uh, the impacts to Lansing on, on the town taxes and on the school district taxes? Um, so we're going to look at that. So over the past uh, 10, 12 years, uh, this plant's valuation has been kind of all over the map, but a high of $160 million. Um, and when you're paying, you know, picture a $160 million house, you pay a lot of taxes. The, 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 the power plant 
has, um, because it's been uneconomic to operate on coal, its value, its worth, its the amount that it generates and can sell into the market has declined. And so in this coming tax year, uh, it's estimated, actually this was set up before Unit 2 went out of commission. So it's probably going to be lower than this. I'm guessing they're going to renegotiate uh, the valuation of the plant, probably be down about 15 million. So it's really, it's declined, um, you know, 90% or more from its, from its high point. Um, and the impact of that has been that over these years, I didn't put every year in, I did 20, 2008, 2012, 2015, and 2018 in this graph, um, that, that the tax uh, revenue from the plant has, whoops, has similarly declined. Um, but so what's interesting in that is that Th these taxes have come down, so these are the school taxes, have come down from the plant used to pay close to $3 million in taxes. It now, on uh, this past year, paid just over a half a million. Uh, for the town taxes, back in the day, it was a quarter of a million dollars. Now it's, now it's around 37000 So, um, you know, the reality is that the town and the residents here have already uh, had to navigate and apparently managed okay. Um, and a lot of that is thanks to very good budgeting on the part of the school district and a part of the town. But, uh, but the tax revenue losses from this plant um, have mostly already occurred. And, um, and you know, the, the thought of this plant uh, going out at this point, and certainly uh, half a million dollars to the school is still something we want to think about how to mitigate um, so, that, so that it doesn't hit the tax base too hard. But the good news is, is that Lansing has been growing in a lot of other ways, and a lot of other new um, expensive homes have happened here, and a lot of townhouse and, and other developments have happened here, some business growth has happened here, and all of that has helped to keep the tax base overall in the town growing even while this plant has lost value, honestly also while the mall has lost value. Um, so, you know, towns and managing the taxes is, is always a dynamic process. Um, but for those that, that may want to say that uh, that we need the taxes and the plant has to keep operating, I, I challenge you to uh, to think about how bad you need it. Do you really want to tell Vera that we want to keep this plant going um, on gas? for the taxes when uh, that's the impact to her, to her neighborhood. I hate to even talk with you about what the property tax impacts have been down there, but I'm sure they're extreme. So so anyhow, I think that that, oh, oh yeah. There are alternatives, and we're seeing them happen out in California, and they can happen here. Um, California has said no more conversion of gas power plants to burn coal. Or, or sorry, of coal power plants to burn gas. They've said that um, from now on, those plants will only be allowed to, to use their properties to put in solar and energy storage. And that that's a much more economic and obviously much more environmentally sound way to go. So in conclusion, the plant is old. It's had a history of groundwater and water pollution. Two severe emergencies that put the lives of workers and volunteer responders at risk. The proposal to bring gas in by truck will cause wear and tear on the roads, traffic and quality of life disturbances, and unacceptable safety risks. When the life cycle of methane is properly accounted for, burning gas is as bad or worse for global warming than burning coal. The conversion to gas will increase VOC emissions and risks of smog production. And uh, I'd suggest that it's time to take action to urge the DEC to not approve Cuba's proposal and instead urge the company to pursue options for solar and storage. So I want to thank you for that. And um, we're going to bring up uh, Katie Quinn Jacobs, who will, who will talk a bit about how we can organize and take action. Katie's with um, a fabulous grassroots organizing uh, organization called Mothers Out Front. And just so you guys know, it's it's not just for mothers. It's for anybody who cares about, about um, the kids and the future of this planet. So um, Katie.
experience and you're probably um, maybe thinking, well, what can I, how, how do I fit into this? What can I do? And um, that is part of why I'm here today with Mothers Out Front. We are a grassroots um, uh, organization and we have a national um, organization, but um, each individual team, a chapter, uh, works on something in their own backyard and makes us a little bit different. Um, so the teams decide what they want to work on. We're hoping to get a team together here in Lansing and you can sign up uh, to, we have a table outside. Okay, so let me tell you a little, little bit. Um, the art, the team I joined, uh, we decided to work on Borger Station, which is already been mentioned here today. It's on Ellis Hollow Creek Road. It's a Title V facility. Like the Cayuga Power Plant, which means that it's a major source of pollution. That's its designation from the EPA. It's owned by Dominion Energy, and it compresses gas. It's one of a series of compressor stations that runs this 200-mile um, line pipeline called the Dominion New Market Pipeline, and it takes um, frac gas from Pennsylvania and Ohio and parts of West Virginia go into this pipeline and it goes you know, sort of northeast across New York State and um, delivers gas into the capital region. Okay. So there, when we started looking at what we could do, um, we, there was, there's a lot that needs to be done. So we came up with a strategy pie that just sort of divided our work so that we could start to work um, in so like sort of smaller groups of like two or three of us worked on different aspects um, of the problem. And we've had a lot of successes um, and I'll just highlight these. Uh, there's too much to go through. But one of the um, biggest things is to inform and engage the public, like what we're doing here today. Um, with community meetings, um, we pulled in the, our concerns to the Driving Town Board and the Tompkins County Legislature, the Tompkins County Health Department, um, which actually came out to some of our events. And we also sat down at the table with Dominion Energy and raised our concerns with them. We worked on safety issues, as Vera was saying. Um, it's this is this compressor station is already part of the the gas industry, so it's going to be much harder for us to, um, you know, we're not going to be shutting it down, but maybe we can contain it. You know, maybe we can stop it from expanding, and maybe we can make it a safer place. And so um, these were some of the things that we worked on. Um, one of the highlights we just got operational was this public notification system, which Dana, can you raise your hand, Dana? Okay, Dana um, it is, was instrumental in helping us uh, get this together. And this is through the SWIFT 911 system um, through Tompkins County. We now have a uh, subscription you can sign up for for the border station. So if you want to be notified about when blow downs are going to happen, when they do maintenance at the plant, they shoot gas up through the stack, and that's when you hear this big roar and they ignite the gas. And that this way, uh, the residents have a way of knowing when that's going to be happening. Um, that, and then we're also working. Oops, go backwards. Um, we're working on the um, the equipment upgrades. This is something that's in progress now, and we may all be asking you for help with that because their application is coming up. Um, it's due now, and there will be a public comment for that soon. But um, we want them to upgrade their equipment so there's fewer emissions. We also did a monitoring program. Lizzie, can you raise your hand? <laughs> Lizzie was the head of our monitoring, and. Um, um, we uh, no one had we discovered that no one has monitored the air quality in Ellis Hollow, and so we um, collaborated with the environmental health professionals, and um, we got some grant money, and we did a monitoring of Ellis Hollow. The D Dominion Energy does not actually test the air. We were very surprised to find this out. They just 
figure it out based on what equipment they're using, and they use mathematical algorithms to um, estimate what the emissions are based on that. So uh, we did our phase one last year. We just completed our phase two this year, and we will be um, probably doing a third round in the winter time. Okay, um, the legal and regulatory, this was a place that we really were able to, um, for the next time around, we're gonna be in a very different position. Well, the research we did, we discovered that it wasn't really clear uh, what kind of permitting uh, Dominion was operating under, and um, it's now clear to the town board and to Dominion and to our the community. And the next time around, we're going to be able to apply um, our zoning process in driving to any kind of an expansion. So. As mothers, um, we care. And every time you see mothers, also translate it like, uh, like everyone's welcome, okay? <laughs> um, we care about a livable planet for our kids. We have to do this, um, and it's you know one of the defining um, you know thoughts for, you know behind our work. I have three sons. I raised in Ethica. And I live in the town of Dryden, but I'm right on the edge there. And uh, now they're all <coughs> these guys age. <laughs> and um, uh, they are all very aware of what's ahead of them as a generation. So we want to have a just transition. We know that we need to have a swift, complete, and a just transition um, away from fossil fuels and to a clean, renewable future. And to get that, um, it takes into consideration transitioning jobs to uh, clean energy jobs, taking, um, thinking about impacts on schools, and um, what impacts this will have, this kind of transition will have on our friends and neighbors. We are inviting all of you <laughs> to a house party. We're a grassroots uh, organization, so one of the things we do is we have house parties um, from time to time. This was the first one I ever went to, was, that's me, <coughs> the back there. Um, this is at Ellen's house, and you can see we just barely salvaged the cake for the photograph. <laughs> it was coconut, it was totally amazing. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, so this is where you get a chance to meet other people in your community who want to work on um, uh, the issue at hand, um, get to know more about how Mother Self from, uh, can help was doing that. And uh, we have a community organizer, her name is Lisa Marshall. I don't. I think Lisa actually took this photo and unfortunately she wasn't able to make it here today because she's also doing a, a Rise Up uh, project out in uh, Corsets. Oh, when the party is. So the party is Wednesday, September 26th, 6.30 to 9 p.m. Um, we have this email list. Sign up for that, and we'll give you the details on the location. We just don't want to share the location and how it's setting. Okay, and we also I want to invite you on October 9th. We have a regular business meeting in Ithaca, and that is um, our Mother's Out Front Tompkins meeting. And again, email list will send you um, notice of you know, reminder of uh, when it's going to be and where it's going to be. Uh, our website is moftompkins.org. And I, um, I think, well, Tanya's here, too. <laughs> and Gina. Gina go. She's, oh, OK. She's, there's Gina. Um, so there's a, a number of us here today. If you see anyone with Mother's Out Front shirt, on my way here today, I kept on feeling weird because I didn't have any brochures, I didn't have the trifold, I didn't have a table. I was like, yeah, I actually said to my husband, I feel strange, I'm not carrying anything, I feel like I forgot something. We got about um, 10 minutes down the road, and I realized I forgot my mother's out front shirt. But um, if you see it, any of us and you have questions, um, please um, just tap us on the shoulder and be happy to answer them. Thank you.
thank you everyone for your attention and your interest and again for coming out today. Um, in terms of taking action, there are some petitions that are being circulated right now and I urge you to please sign those. There are also on your way out uh, on the table on the inside, there's uh, some postcards and postcard is kind of a misnomer. They're the size of postcards. Uh, and they have stuff on the front and words on the back for you to sign your name. And, and we want to send these to uh, the DEC, to Commissioner Sagos of the DEC. The thing is, we've learned over the years that putting a stamp and people saying they'll, they'll mail it later doesn't happen. And so I ask you to please take the time at the table to, to fill in the postcard. We have them on clipboards. So you don't have to stand right at the table and cause a log jam. But please fill in the postcards and hand them back to us so that we can collect them and send them into the DDC for you. Uh, there's also some notices coming around. We have a dance party coming up at the end of uh, the month. Uh, it was, I think it was uh, Emma Goldman who said, if I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. <laughs> and I support that too, and I'm glad to see that there's some others who do. You know, the last dance party we had was to celebrate um, that we had stopped a pipeline. Uh, the dance party this time is, is different, but dance is a really wonderful thing to bring a community together and to celebrate and share our strengths and, and feel the energy that we have when we come together that we are going to need to bring ourselves forward. So I urge you to come out to the dance party. It's free. Um, we welcome you to bring snacks and, and stuff. There will be a cash bar. Um, but it's, it's going to be really fun and also really important to help us build the momentum for this. Um, one other action for those of you that uh, want to do this, and I, I invite you to do this, it would be great. Uh, we have these postcard posters, Why I Rise. And you can fill in your, your answer to why do you rise for climate. Is it because of your kids? Is it, you know, whatever, whatever your reasons are, why, why do you rise for climate? And um, <laughs> so the methane, <laughs> Sandra rises for climate so the methane won't. Um, and Carmi, Carmi will take a picture and we'll post it uh, on social media and make sure that the governor and that the DEC and that the country and the world that is also doing Rise for Climate events today will see why we rise here in Lansing. So I really, really thank you all for coming out. And um, I just want to lead you in. Oh, uh, yes? Just a quick question. Can somebody just give us a synopsis on where we are in this process with this plant? Sure. Where we are in this process with this plant is that they have submitted their application. The DEC doesn't yet consider that application complete. Uh, once they do consider it complete, so the DEC is probably asking for more information about whatever. Um, once it's complete, the DEC has 60 days uh, in which to issue uh, their recommendation. The way this went over on Seneca Lake with the Greenwich power plant that was a coal plant that converted to gas is it was given a negative declaration, meaning that the DEC didn't think there was any significant environmental impact because these Title V permits that they're looking to modify, all the DEC does is look at what comes out of the chimney. And what comes out of the chimney, as we talked about, is so-called cleaner from gas than it is from coal. So we have a fight on our hands to push the DEC to get with the science of today and not with the science of 20, 2007 and tell them that methane matters, that we don't want this plant happening, we certainly don't want these trucks bringing it in, and we want this stopped. So, so um, it's important, actually, in my opinion, that we rise sooner than later. I don't want to wait for that negative declaration because it's a really tough fight to get the DEC to roll back once they recommended that there's no problems. It's a really uphill fight, so I want them to hear from us now that we are not going to stand for this. Thank you for the question. Yeah, a couple other questions. Uh, I don't have a question, but uh, we're trying to coordinate. I'm Kathy Russell from Fossil Free Tompkins. We're trying to co yeah. coordinate tabling to get these carts. Sign. So I'll be up front here. If you would like to help sit at a table 
and talk to people and get these cards signed so that we get, wow, a massive number of these cards signed to send to the DEC. If you'll help us table, please come up and talk to me afterwards, okay? And, and that's not tabling not just for today, but, but we're, we have all kinds of events happening around the community, and we'd love some help getting people out on the streets and helping us get petitions signed and postcards signed. Um, thanks, Kathy. Yeah. Where is NYSEG and uh, the Public Service Commission? Where is NYSEG and the Public Service Commission and all this? Good, another good question. NYSEG has no say in this. Uh, there, uh, any, any, you know, since this deregulation that I talked about, anybody who wants to try and put up a power plant and make money can do it. Uh, they sell it into the wholesale market. And, uh, you know, good luck if you can out compete other people in terms of the price that you want to get for your electricity, then, then you get to put your power into the grid. So that's, it's an open market system. The Public Service Commission, again, I, you know, I don't have a lot of history with this, but the, the power plant over on Seneca Lake uh, went through and was approved under what was called light regulation. Again, because it's considered that the burning gas is cleaner than burning coal. Yeah, okay. suggestion and request that folks from Lansing, um, if you can meet up in this front um, and we'll get you to sign a special seat so we know that you're from Lansing and you know if you're willing to to uh, have us reach out to you, um, there are probably a variety of actions to be involved in, not only uh, working with Mike Siefert, but also with your town board here, because your town and your town board uh, are the only other uh, area that has a, a large say in this process in front of the DEC. Um, so, so it's going to be really important that the town board here hears from you as well. Yeah, another question? I was just wondering, who's providing the financing for uh -huh. the power plant? The financing for the power plant is a very interesting question. Um, it, they uh, initially were, as I said, owned by, by NYSEG, then they were bought out by AES. AES uh, declared bankruptcy in 2011. Before they did that, they pulled over a quarter of a billion dollars out back to their shareholders before they declared bankruptcy and said, well, we have no money. Um, then, then they were very strategic in how they, um, they, they took a bunch of their bondholders and shareholders and and just reformulated into uh, the upstate New York power producers uh, who were very strategic. You can tell that. that you remember I talked about how they, how they came out of bankruptcy and then the very next month they mothballed. That's because they knew that there was a reliability concern and that they could start getting us ratepayers to pay for their operation. They then dragged out the proceeding for four years, um, keeping us on the hook for $4 million a month um, well, they collected our money, um, and then, uh, in, in a baffling turn of events, the power plant was bought by a company um, named, uh, initially named uh, Riesling and Beowulf, and then they've gone undergone some name change, and now they're called Hararot. Well, we have to have the journalist here in the room, um, Peter, hiding under his baseball cap who uh, did some digging around that, and what Peter found is that the parent company of, of Hararot, and it, you know, I talk about it as Her, uh, uh, the parent company is Blackstone. It's one of the largest hedge funds in the world. It's, it's a hedge fund that has other hedge funds um, and, and more subsidiaries than a Russian nesting doll. Um, which helps to insulate them from any of the kinds of uh, liabilities. Uh, anyhow, 
what, what we now know, thanks to Peter's research on this, uh, is that the director of uh, Cuomo's campaign, and for, before that, I believe he was the chief of staff to Cuomo, um, and uh, Peter, what's his name? I'm blanking. Bill Mulrow, thank you. Bill, Bill Mulrow. Guess what? Bill works for Blackstone. Right? Yeah. So there's there's that whole angle on this too. So that's that's the, the big story of where the financing comes. Um, the long play for this power plant is probably they're going to wait and see what happens with the nukes. The nukes are all under subsidy right now in this state because they're old and dying. Um, and uh, when the subsidies run out for the nukes in another, I think it's nine or ten years, uh, I think the long play is to think about whether this power plant will be able to you know, come back to life and really really provide energy then. I think that that's what they're looking towards. So so this is this is a long game. Um, if we can stop them now, uh, they're pretty uneconomic to operate on coal. They can't do it with one burner. Um, so, so maybe we can stop together and just put them out as my hope. Uh, so, so with that, I want to um, invite everyone to join us for the rally just down the street uh, by the high school, or by the middle school, actually. So if you head down Ridge Road, it's about a mile and a half down on the right-hand side. Uh, we'll be having a rally there and press conference. We hope that media will be joining us. Uh, and uh, Sandra and Joe Heath, and I forget who else. Oh, Bob Howard, um, and some other speakers. Uh, uh, students from Cornell. Students from Cornell. Uh, mothers um, out front. So um, don't go away because we've got this kind of amazing lineup that we uh, pulled together. Um, we media will be there. We want the, to show the, the depth and breadth of uh, citizen engagement on this uh, on this issue, and this is your chance to rise up. So. So, Lots of data first, and then this kind of kick-ass rally next. Right. And so to put you all in the mood, because I do not end um, <coughs> my talks without rousing people to action, our air and water are under attack. What do we do? Stand, Stand up, up like that. <laughs> New York <laughs> State is still being cracked. What do we do? Stand <laughs> up like that. Great. So I hope we'll see everybody down the road. Lansing residents, please take a minute and just, just stop by and let us collect all of your names if you're willing to stay involved. Um, don't forget the map over here. If, if you want to see if you're on the routes, there's uh, small maps on the table, and then you can pin a sticker on the map over here and fill in some information. Uh, again, thank you, everyone, for your interest in this. before we get to the science and the law. And it goes like this. I'm going to ask you a question, and then you reply. We say don't. We are rising, so the methane won't. Got it? All right. Call to gas. We, we say don't. don't. We are rising, so the methane won't. Gas-filled trucks. We say don't. We are rising so the methane won't. Pollute our lake. We say don't. We are rising so the methane won't. Frack Pennsylvania. We say don't. We are rising so the methane won't. Wreck our climate. We say don't. We are rising so the methane won't. Threaten our kids? We say don't. We are rising so the methane won't. Mess with moms? We say don't. We are rising so the methane won't. Ignore the science? We say don't. We are rising so the methane won't. Frack our future? We say don't. We are rising, so the methane won't. All right. Yeah. I made that one up myself. Um, so I have a message directly for Governor Cuomo. Governor Cuomo, we are rising, 
so the methane won't. And we are rising higher than the temperature in July. We are rising faster than the floodwaters of August that dropped nine inches of rain on the village of Lodi and sent cottages floating down neighborhoods. Governor Cuomo, we are rising so the methane won't. We are rising with more economic consequence than the floods in Watkins Glen that made the water unpotable for nine days and canceled a three-day music festival that would have been attended by 30,000 people. We are rising so the methane won't. Governor Cuomo, we are rising with more permanence than the mercury from the coal burning power plant that's been on our shores since 1955 and that now contaminates the fish in our beloved lake. We are already risen. We rose to stop fracking in New York State. And we did that. We rose to stop the storage of frack gas at Seneca Lake. Yeah. And 653 arrests later, we did that. Yeah. And some of us rose inside of our jail cells. We are so rose that we can see the emissions from the Cayuga power plant stacks. And we know that right now, because it burns coal, that those emissions include fine particle matter that cause learning disabilities in our children and have evidence for causing dementia in us old people. That's how rose we are, we know that. <laughs> We're so rose that we can see that if we switch that coal for gas, those emissions would include volatile organic chemicals, which are neurotoxicants. That's how rose we are. We are so rose that we can see all the way to Pennsylvania and see the cries of our brothers and sisters in the fracking fields of Pennsylvania. And we know that we don't want to hear them crying when we turn on the lights for electricity because the methane in their bedrock has been turned inside out and hauled up here by truck so we can turn the lights on. We're so rose, we know that's wrong. We know that we are our brother's keepers. Yes. We are so rose that we can see all the way to Vermont where there is solar power and different homeowners have storage batteries so they don't need peaker plants like the one that they want to turn Cayuga power into. They can run it all by sunlight. That's how rose we are. And to quote Maya Angelou, still, we rise. Yeah. Governor Cuomo, we rise, so the methane won't. Yeah. So my first speaker today is Dr. Robert Howarth, the David Ak uh, Atkinson uh, Professor of Ecology and Environmental Sciences. Um, I think I just butchered that. Uh, wrote an amazing paper in 2011 that showed us how we have been underappreciating methane as a greenhouse gas and showed us in papers published since then that we cannot solve the climate crisis without capturing and apprehending both villains, carbon dioxide and methane. Dr. Howard. Thank you, Sandra. And thank you all for coming today. Sandra asked me to talk just uh, for a few minutes about methane and what we know. Uh, I don't have any notes, so I might ramble a little bit, but uh, let me start by saying, as you know, natural gas is methane. Overwhelmingly, methane is the uh, component of natural gas. Methane is also a greenhouse gas. It's the second most important greenhouse gas after carbon dioxide. There's not as much of it in the atmosphere, but it is over a hundred times more powerful in its ability to trap heat for the time it's in the atmosphere. Now, early in this century, early in the 21st century, the methane levels in the atmosphere were flat. They're problematic, they're contributing to warming, but they were flat. Over the last decade, methane has been rising in the atmosphere. It's rising in the atmosphere at the most rapid rate this planet has ever seen in the last four billion years. Let me say that again. Over the last decade, 
Methane is rising at its most rapid rate ever in the history of this planet. Now, where's that methane coming from? One can speculate it was flat for a decade and then it's been going up. What happened over the last decade globally that's really different? Fracking is what happened that's really different. And the science on that has been controversial, it's been complicated, but I want to tell you that over the last six months, the science has become quite clear, and it is quite clear that fracked gas is the major reason that the methane is rising at the most rapid rate ever in the atmosphere. So fracking is contributing to global warming in a way even I didn't really appreciate a few years ago. Now, the planet's warming at the most rapid rate we've seen in several hundred thousand years. We're seeing consequences of that, more droughts, more floods, stronger hurricanes, bigger rain events. Methane is a major contributor to that global warming at this point. The rate of warming we're seeing each of the last half dozen years have been the warmest half dozen years. They would not be the warmest half dozen years if it were not for fracking, if it were not for methane. Now here in New York, we banned fracking. That is a great thing. I'm very proud to be a New Yorker. I'm very proud to have helped contribute to that. But we are burning fracked gas. Make no mistake about it. All of the natural gas we're using throughout New York, and certainly here in Tompkins County, is fracked gas, principally from the Marcellus Shale Fields of Pennsylvania. And in fact, if you look across the nation, nowhere else in the nation is the rate of use of natural gas rising faster than in New York. So we have to take responsibility for the horrors that are happening in Pennsylvania and for the leakage which is occurring. Let me step back a little bit. Fracking is a new thing, right? It's been going on for the last 10 years. It's contributing to this massive rise of methane that we're seeing in the atmosphere. Fracking is entirely a North American phenomenon. It's largely a United States phenomenon. We can see satellite imagery from space that the increased methane emissions are coming from the United States. And within the United States, the biggest increase, the most productive field, is the Marcellus in Pennsylvania. So the biggest problem globally is right on our doorstep, and our consumption of that gas is a major, major problem. We need to stop the build-out of infrastructure and general pipelines, power plants, etc. We need to move to 100% renewable. Now let me say one more thing about the particular plant proposal here, which is to use these trucks to move in gas. Methane leaks when you use it. When you develop it at the, at the well site, it leaks. When you put it in pipelines and compressor station, it leaks. All the way to the final consumer, it leaks. When you move it in trucks, one must assume that you get even larger leakage. Now no one I know of has measured it. We don't really know how much methane is emitted, but it would be impossible to fill these trucks with high pressure compressed gas and not lose a significant amount. It'd be impossible to use it at this power plant and not again lose more. So fracked gas is bad. Moving in this particular way is an even worse horror and we simply must say no to this atrocity. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Joseph Heath Esquire, uh, the uh, General Counsel for the Onondaga Nation, who was there for the prisoners of Attica, a story you can read about in the Pulitzer Prize winning book. He was there for uh, at Standing Rock for the protesters there. He was there for me as a Seneca Lake civil disobedient. And now he's turning his t attention to our struggle here in Lansing, Joe Heath. Well, it's always hard to talk after Sandra and then after Bob, <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate being able to be here. It's good to see some old friends and a lot of new faces. And I um, first, I need to welcome you to Cayuga Nation territory. Yes. yes. Because yes. that's what this yes. is. Right. right. And the Cayugas and the Haudenosaunee took care of this lake for thousands of years. And in 200 years, our capitalist economy has almost destroyed this lake. And that's one of the lessons that we can never forget. Because the Haudenosaunee teach us that we must be stewards of the natural world. 
of the water and the air and preserve them for the future generations yet to come. Those are the instructions that I get every day from the Onondaga Nation and from the traditional Cayugas. And so sometimes it's pretty understandable when we get a little depressed with all that's going on, with all the climate change and the hurricanes and the wildfires. 14 days above 90 degrees in Syracuse, New York. You all know all of these harms that are coming at us. And we saw the charts this morning of how close we are to that tipping point. So it's very easy to think, what can I do? And when Sonda asked me to speak today, I thought about 10 years ago when we first heard about fracking. In August of 2008, Pete Granis, who was then the DEC commissioner, invited some environmentalists to Albany, essentially giving us an alert that this attack was coming. And really, in, in hindsight, I think Pete was asking us to form and organize against it. But that's 10 years ago, and I remember that first DEC report that came out right in September, I think, taking it up to the Adirondacks. We were visiting my uh, stepdaughter and thinking, oh my God. What can I do here? I know you've all felt that. And what we've learned is that when we get together, like we are today, like we did against fracking, like we did against the 81 pipeline, against the unconstitutional pipeline, against the storage facility in Preble, New York, against the storage facility on Seneca Lake, when we get together, we can stop this. But that's the lesson that I really want to share with you today. Many of you know that. And the more we get together and the broader the coalition, the stronger we are. You know, there was a, a headline in the New York Times about six months ago that said, the climate crisis, question mark, it's capitalism, stupid. That's right. right. That's right. There's no other excuse for the greed that goes on. That's right. That's ruining our air and our water and stealing our children's future. And this project is such a perfect illustration of that. You heard a little bit about this this morning. So in order to trace the corporate ownership of this um, Cayuga Power Plant, you need to be a PhD in, in research in corporate shell game. <laughs> but the parent corporation that owns the subsidiary that owns Cayuga Power is called the Blackstone Group. It's a private equity firm. Think about that. So there's this gentleman by the name of William Mulrow, M-U-L-R-O-W. Until January of 1950, or 2015, he was a senior manager at the Blackstone Group, making over a million bucks a year. In January of 2015, I call him Prince Andrew, our governor, <laughs> hired him as secretary, which is the second most powerful position in New York State in reality in, in Albany. So he goes from the corporation into the second floor, into the governor's office in January of 2015. Then in April of 2017, he goes back to Black, the Blackstone Group. It's this revolving door that we hear about between corporation and government. But he also becomes the chairman of Prince Andrew's re-election campaign. And he's now back and making his million bucks a year while he's running that re-election campaign. We all have a chance to voice our opinion about that on Tuesday in the primary. Thursday. 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 <laughs> so we know how far Cuomo was pushed on fracking four years ago because of the left challenge in the primary. So remember that when you vote next week.
And we all know that we that right now they're burning coal and creating more and more coal ash in a pit that's only partially lined right next to Cayuga Lake. Both boilers need to be shut down. We need to end the thermal pollution, which we haven't even heard about, but millions and millions of gallons of heated <coughs> water are going into the lake every, year, every day. We need to clean up and remove those coal prints, coal ash pits, and we need to move to entirely renewable energy. That's yeah. what you all know. Yes. That's what we all yeah. can do together. No more coal, no more frack gas. Right. Yeah. 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 Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Thank you, Joe. There is no group of people that the climate crisis weighs more heavily on than our young people who will live with the consequences of what all of we did before their time on Earth. So I want to introduce um, some amazing folks that I met at Josh Fox's presentation, part of Climate Justice Cornell. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, hello, can everyone hear me? Yeah. I'm Julian Goldberg. I'm here with Climate Justice Cornell. We are, yeah, we are a student-run organization on Cornell campus trying to hold our university and our institutions accountable for their environmental impact. We're working on campaigns on campus, locally, nationally, but we know that these changes start on a local level. It's our power plants, it's our new buildings, it's our endowments. And we know there are thousands of these Rise for Climate rallies happening today across the nation and across the planet. And if everyone can succeed in these local changes, we can win. It's not just us out here alone. And it's not just us here alone. There are the movements for workers' rights, for immigrants' rights, Black Lives Matter, indigenous rights. We are also fighting the same fight as all of those groups. Climate change is disproportionately hurting the people who can't move to escape it, the marginalized communities that can't push the industries out of their homes. And our enemies are also the same. It is the fossil fuel industry, it is the military industrial complex, it is the oligarchs. They are all working together. It is capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. And when we're fighting for climate justice, we are also creating jobs. We are creating sustainable infrastructure that can help these communities be more self-sufficient and not be taken down and exploited by wage labor that <laughs> wage labor that forces them to cooperate with the fossil fuel industry. Um, sorry. <laughs> People need the resources to stop their communities from being poisoned. This isn't just about our children and about our future, it is happening now, all over the world. And the latest research is saying we need to be carbon neutral by 2030 if we're gonna avoid the catastrophic effects of that two degrees of climate change. And after that, we need to be sequestering carbon. So our actions in these next 10, 15 years are setting the path yes. for our planet and our species, our humans. So. Yeah. Every <laughs> every incoming freshman class at Cornell is more educated and more involved and more aware of what is going on in the climate crisis. Times are changing. There is pressure behind this. And like they say that necessity is the mother of invention while well, necessity is the mother of revolution. Yeah. And when, when our institutions and our government are not listening to us and are not being held accountable, we rise up, we rise in solidarity, we rise for justice, and we rise for climate. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Our air and water are under attack. What do we do? Stand up, fight back. Our air and water are under attack. What do we do? Stand up, fight back. Thank you so much for having me. College sophomore, um, I appreciate so much those words and um, yeah, what we used to say was the future 
is actually the kid sitting across the dinner table from us every night. The future is here now. Yes. Um, and moms know it. <laughs> so we have some more voices from Mothers Out Front, my new favorite uh, grassroots organization. Um, I've never seen um, better organizing than I have from these folks. And I'm not sure who is representing us uh, at this. Uh, is I it am, Gina? I'm Dana. Dana, Dana there you are. Okay. Dana and Gina. Okay, this is great. This is a great uh, photo op. Thank you. <laughs> this is Gus. I'm sure you've seen and heard him bash his trucks during everyone's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Dana. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. This is Gus, the fuss. He's five, hazelnut is uh seven i have a teenager i think still in bed yeah and our oldest is at purity ice cream working the breakfast and lunch shift which we'll be picking up after my wife is also at work we are a family of six we live in ellis hollow in the town of dryden we are a little under a mile from the borger compressor station we moved into our dream home two years ago and then discovered oh our our neighbor <laughs> The one we didn't really care for. So I am involved now for these guys, for myself, for you all. I in, find myself to be inspired by all of you, and I am not so inspired. It's good to show up to things. It's good to meet people. My dream is that the Cayuga power plant would just be disassembled. And so when my kids are older, I'll say, there used to be a power plant over there. And there used to be a compressor station where you guys are playing now, and where your grandkids are playing. There's absolutely no reason why we need this. There's none. 100% renewables. We are New York. Governor Cuomo, you are a leader. The United States looks to New York on what we're doing, and they follow suit. Please be a leader. Look at our cute children. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, thanks for coming out. Yeah. Thank you, Dana. Um, I joined Mothers Out Front when this issue came knocking on my door because of Mothers Out Front informing the neighborhood of Ellis Hollow that this, these tubes coming out of the ground were cracked gas being compressed in my backyard. I was pregnant at the time and I was scared for what this could be in for my pregnancy. And I got involved. And I had the privilege of being on buses to Albany and meeting so many people at my town board meetings and finding strength that I didn't know I had by being surrounded by these courageous people. And what always really irritates me is how much work there's still left to do um, finding out that this Cayuga power plant that's lied to us about putting in solar for so long, I, I, it just, we cannot allow this. I, I mean, whatever it takes, we're going to go there. It's nice that we have all of you here. I'm so proud to see Cornell here representing, honest, honestly, because um, you're holding your, your school responsible, and I've been at some of those town board meetings. Uh, you know, you read the paper and it's just not, it's just not the truth out there. Um, so the one thing that I just hope is that we continue to get together and I will open up my house for parties. I want us to get together and I want us to figure out how we could keep rallying and keep growing in size and, and show that we're not going away, that we're getting bigger and we are going to be a thorn in the side of the ass of any fracked gas that thinks they're going to come and pollute our area. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you everyone. It's amazing to see you and I'm going to ask Irene to lead us in a few more chants. Right. You got your clock back over I, I do. Actually, I, I also want, this is a fabulous crowd and wonderful signs and I wonder can we get this no frack gas Cayuga sign in the center and everybody kind of pull in. Fine, use your and other, other arm. On the count of three, we're all going to go wide. Okay? Everybody, Gary, you good for that? Yeah. 
Okay. No, oh. pre 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 yeah. All, right, All right, great. Well, you guys, thank everyone for coming out. Um, I have another cheer for us to leave on. It's, ah. it's very simple, and it's about what we want. And it goes, no coal, no gas, renewable energy now. You can clap, I just don't have to hear. <laughs> renewable energy now. No coal, no gas, renewable energy now. No coal, no gas. Renewable energy now! No coal! No gas! Renewable energy now! No coal! No gas! Renewable energy now! So there's a table set up back there, um, and there have been a couple of people circulating with postcards, which I see are now dribbled along the lawn because I probably did that. Thank you.